Good afternoon and welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. This is my 30 minute show every Friday. Welcome back and uh, for those of you who are watching this on TV, you might, as, you might be a little bit shocked to see me wearing a mask today. For those of you listening to this on a podcast or a radio, I am indeed in the studio wearing a mask so my voice may be a little bit muffled but uh you know if covid has taught us anything it's to look after each other and protect yourself and most importantly wash 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 your flipping hands people please um i don't have covid but i do have a cold and out of consideration for my colleagues here i'm not going to spit all over the microphone and spread the disease and that's why i'm wearing a mask it is out of consideration and protection for those around me and i I sincerely hope that we've learned some lessons from COVID. We cough in our elbows and not in our hands. We wash our hands. We wear masks as and when necessary to protect others as much as ourselves, but more importantly, to protect others and show a bit of consideration uh, for other people and not make them sick. I hope that this is a wake-up call for everybody. I hope that we've come to realise that certain things need to be done. However, going to places like McDonald's during the COVID, I'd noticed that they didn't sanitise the F-Post machines or the exit door or the um, toilet taps. And uh, I did point out all three things to these people, but of course they did nothing. So these idiots might not, might as well not have even bothered with screens and sanitising because they missed the three key areas where everyone was going to transmit the disease from person to person. So half a job, my friends, is no job at all. If you're going to do this, you have to do it properly and you have to sanitise everything. Not just the services you're putting the burgers on, but there's flipping FPOS machines that every single person is touching and a lot of people aren't washing their hands or using sanitizer. and I noticed that. Nor were they keeping social distance. I was standing back, waiting for people to exit a shop, only to watch people shoving in front of me. So uh, I basically just gave up and walked away. And I was sorely disappointed to see that people took this so lightly. People in quarantine escaping, not giving a rat's ass whether they destroy the country or kill thousands of people. Oh, no, 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 they had to go shopping. You see, they couldn't be denied for two weeks. What you've got to do if you do get put in isolation, bloody hell, treat it like a holiday, a two-week holiday where you can just veg out, eat crisps, watch Netflix and have a good time. It's not so very hard two weeks out of your life. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny sacrifice to make to look after everybody around you who you're supposed to care for and love. Wow. Those of you who break the rules only make it doubly difficult for everybody else because it only takes one in a hundred to break the rules for a plague to break out, and this thing's only been mild. You know, I used to research, in fact, I still do research plagues over a period of time. Um, like the the Great Plague that swept through London, the Black Death, just before the Great Fire, and that killed one in three people. It was far, far, far more virulent than anything else that we had ever known, and it completely destroyed that society. Also, the last vestiges of the Roman Empire collapsed in 524 under Justinian the Great at Byzantium, and again, it was the Black Plague that completely destroyed that entire culture and civilization. So, you know, history has been shouting at us throughout the decades and indeed even the millennia, but still we fail to learn the lessons of the past. And if we do so, then we are doomed only to repeat them, those mistakes. And I see it happening and I worry for the future. I know that everyone's talking about vaccine, 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 well guess what? In something between 20 to 30 years, no vaccines are going to work anymore. Unfortunately, viruses um, mutate and the mutations become resistant to all vaccines and we end up with what we call superbugs and they are breaking out more and more frequently in hospitals, knocking people off. And as I say, Within a few decades, there will be no more vaccines and everyone will simply die. So we need to find a new way and science is not doing anything about it. Nothing whatsoever. Simply going down the same path, hoping that she'll be right for a little while longer. Well, I won't be here, but I have warned you all. So when it does happen, 
I hope my voice is still echoing in your ears and you do something about it. Okay, well that's a little bit about COVID and wearing masks and looking after each other, but my show's not just about that, it's about mental health issues. And we've found that there is a lot more stress, anxiety and depression amongst everybody, but especially the poor school kids who have had their year interrupted. I really feel sorry for the young ones, you know, I've got a lot of time for young people these days, and I really do feel for them and their struggles what they've had to go through and I think that all of us need to just give these kids a break and just give them a pass, you know. Um, some people may be concerned that that's watering down the pool of talent but honestly um, when you consider everything that they've gone through I think that's the very least we can do. It's just take some of the stress and worry away because this is going to affect their entire working careers. So I think we need to give these kids a break and just give them a thumbs up and say there you go, there's, there's your there's your school CUE, whatever, and, um, you know, sorry that this has happened to you, but at least we'll help where we can. And that's that's what it's all about, you know, when it comes to mental health. You help where you can, you do what you can. You don't necessarily have to move mountains, but just one act of kindness can make such a difference. It can save a life. It can save someone from years and years and years of, of mental torture and stress, and um, it's good to see the conversation is now being had and there's some extraordinarily brave people like Mike King and Stan Walker, very high profile people who are sharing their pain with everybody else and that's an extraordinarily hard thing to do and I mean it's boots and all, it's the absolute truth and it's, it's heart rending. Um, when you hear their stories, what they had to go through, and yet somehow they have managed to rise up despite all the things that have happened to them that prove that violence doesn't have to continue. It doesn't have to be handed on. It can be broken, and you can still be a good person. Now, I'll tell you what, that young Stan Walker will probably be the best dad any kid's ever had, and um, it's only through brave people like them, but they're the high-profile ones. There's little people like me who do this job, it costs me money, I have to sacrifice my time to do this, and I'm doing my bit. And the reason that I'm doing it is because the government pays for my food, and if they didn't, I would starve. So I kind of feel duty-bound to do my bit to help people as and where I can. I can't hold down a regular job because I can't quite simply can't sleep at night. I was up until 2, 3 this morning. I have terrible problems sleeping. I have nightmares, anxiety, and I always have had, you know. Um, it has been worse in the past, and, and I'm working to get myself better. And, um, you know, I always remember what Aruna Patel told me about being mindful, about learning to appreciate the small things that you do have and being more in the moment, more present, more here, rather than thinking about all the terrible things that happened in the past or what might happen in the future. Deal with the here and now and make the best of today. And that's all you really need to concern yourself with. The past you cannot change, and as long as you're doing everything right now, the future will surely look after itself if you know that you're travelling in the right direction. But it always helps to kick ideas around and bounce them off other people, and you'd be surprised. You know, even out of the mouths of babes and fools come words of wisdom. That's so true. And you just never know where you might uh, hear an idea and you'll think, wow, I never thought about that. That's actually a really, really good idea. So... You know, try not to be too judgmental because you'd really be surprised what some people can come up with and how it can be of great benefit from you. So don't be too dismissive of what people say. And I would like to think that's especially true of what I have to say because I've had a half a century of suffering and uh, I have a unique perspective on a lot of things like, you know, extreme drug abuse, suicide, death, depression... You know, I have been through the mill, and I'd like to think that I could do my bit to possibly ease suffering in other people and encourage all you folks out there to do your best. 
Now, I'd like to say a special hello to all the farmers out there today. Go you good things. I see that some of you are already starting to cut grass. Boy, that makes my heart happy when I see you starting in the back end of spring. I grew up on a farm, and I know what wonderful, hard-working people these are, covered in muck, and when things are tough and you've got the a cold or the flu, you just got to guts it on through and hope the missus comes to give you a hand milk and the cows, but boy, it's a tough road out there, you're isolated, you're on your own, and, you know, we're starting to come to the realisation that farmers do stuff a enormous financial stresses, massive work burdens, different times of the year, you know, carving and lambing is always a, you know, all hands to the pump time of year, extremely stressful and hard you know you're doing your best to care for every animal you can you're going to get losses and those losses hurt not just financially but you know they hurt you spiritually because you feel like somehow you let that creature down by it going out you know the bobby calves i remember having to raise the flag every time i put a bobby calf out and i would cry as i walked back over the cattle race because i knew i'd failed to raise that animal well enough to be worth some money and have a good life and instead it was off to turn into luncheon meat so you know it's it's hard i understand what farmers go through it's a, it's a very difficult life but it's extraordinarily rewarding working with animals and uh you know you, you are truly connected um, to life, to animals, to the land. Um, you really identify with doing a positive job, providing good, clean food. You know, a lot of people like to have a pop at farmers. I'll tell you what, there's no harder working people, there's no better people than those folks, and um, really they need our support, not our criticism. All right, time to box on with my uh, story today. I don't just talk about depression or cutting grass. Um, I also read some stories of the joys and the struggles I had in my adventures around the world. I spent seven and a half years travelling the world and um, although I suffered from depression, it didn't stop me from having an amazing adventure and, you know, we had some awesome, awesome times out in Africa, me and my mates together, doing the game parks and all that. I spent two and a half years out there and you know, we travelled around Europe a lot, we met a lot of friends, and uh, this today is one of the stories of um, me stupidly going to um, visit some friends in winter time over, over there in Christmas, New Year's is winter, and it's particularly cold, viciously cold, um, sub-zero, snow, all that bollocks, so... Uh, yeah, you can come unstuck very easy if you're not properly prepared or used to it, which I was not. And as a result, um, we have this story called The Longest March Home, and this is how it goes. It was winter in London, and Christmas was closing in fast. Work on the building sites was dwindling off, and I was missing home. I was slowly coming around to the idea that I would never leave London, and she was to become my new home. But I didn't know anyone in London too well, other than my best mate, Seedy and he was off to Germany to see our old mate Manfred in Mannheim. I was freezing my ass off in the big old squat I lived in in South London, just off the old Kent Road. So I went for a final pint with Seedy down the Thomas of Beckett before he headed off to Germany. I loved those pubs down the old Kent Road, the Henry Cooper, the Green Man, the Thomas of Beckett, the Gin Palace and the Elephant Castle. But the Thomas of Beckett was my favourite in London. Many of them had gymnasiums and rings for professional boxers upstairs and they produced some real class boxers right up to international standard. I got to know a few of the boxers who worked as bouncers for a bit of extra cash. They were hard men but real good fellas and I watched a few of them fight for titles at places like Crystal Palace. Whilst I was having our last few ales, Seedy suggested I go to Manfred's in Germany to have Christmas with them all. We chewed the fat for a while because it was just a couple of weeks till Christmas. Also, I didn't have too much spare cash for accommodation in Monheim. Seedy talked me into it, assuring me we'd have a great time, something to remember. How right he was. 
C headed off before me, so I had to organise my own way over in a hurry. I didn't have any maps or much in the way of clothes or cash, but what the hell. I booked the trip on the bus from London to Dover, then the ferry to Calais, France, then a bus on to Frankfurt. From there it was a short tram ride out to Mannheim. I rang Manfred and told him I'd be at the train station at 3pm Wednesday before Christmas, but he ended up heading off a day earlier than I planned. On the way to Dover, on the bus, I met a guy from Heidelberg who offered to let me stay at his folks' place. So we sailed over the English Channel and ended up that night in Heidelberg. I spent a wonderful, somewhat cold and snow-covered day there. The chap's grandmother took a dislike to me and insisted I leave the next day. Some of those old Germans were strange, but I was happy enough to finally meet my old friend Manfred on the platform in Monheim. I was so relieved to see him, and he took me back to the small flat he and Jutta shared. We had a great dinner with some friends, then got on the mulled wine. Over a few drinks, a friend of Manfred's, Brigitte, offered to put Sadie and me up for the night in a small loft in her flat. We gratefully accepted and got rolling on schnapps and vodka, then headed off to Brigitte's flat. It was snowing and really cold on the way home and I realised my coat and clothes were not really adequate for such a cold European winter. The flat too was really cold and the tiny attic she showed us up to was only heated by a tiny paraffin heater. The attic was half a storey above the first floor in a tiny flat around the cobblestone quadrant. We hunkered down the best we could, but I had troubled dreams all night. Despite my drunken space state, I kept waking up, imagining rats were running over my blankets. I woke up freezing at first light and shook Seedy awake. There were rats running over us last night, weren't there, I asked him. Yeah, let's get the F out of here, he said. We raced off down the stairs, but the door was locked. So we headed back up to the attic, hopped out through a window and slid off the snow-covered roof down to the cobblestone below, a long way down. But it sure felt good to escape those rats. Turns out, Brigitte had kept pet rats, but they had escaped. Then wild rats had come in and bred with the pet rats, living under the floors and in the walls. What a nightmare. Nonetheless, our stay in Mannheim was wonderful. We visited one of the two, one or two older folks who had lived through the war, and they came across markedly different to the younger generations. Most of our days were compiled of drinking the Germans' wonderful pills and vodka, and going for long walks in the snow. It was amazing to see how thick it piled up on the trees. Christmas turned out to be a pretty tame affair, but New Year's Eve was a real blast. A few of us went round drunk as skunks blowing out street lights with pistols which shot like starting guns. I've never seen anything like it. I really like staying with the Germans. They are an interesting and complex people of somewhat flawed. They seem tied to their past in all of its dark and awkward ways, glorious and yet terrible. That is where the complexity comes from. It was an enlightening time. In those days, Germany was still split into East and West. A year or two later, the wall came down, and the world continued to change as it must. After New Year's, I had to head back to London. I had virtually no money left and no maps or plan of how I would get back to London. Manfred dropped me about 20 kilometres out of Mannheim and I had to hitchhike my way down through Germany, then hook right to Aachen at the border of Belgium and cross through Belgium via Brussels to Ostend and back across the Channel to Dover and on to London. On the motorway it was cold, grey in the middle and white on the shoulders. There was ice under the snow on the shoulders, which made walking down the sides very slow, slippery and difficult. 
Vehicles were travelling fast and no trucks seemed willing to stop. In those days I was young, fit and very strong. I could easily walk 20 kilometres a day and I was prepared to do whatever it took to get back to London. But the more the day wore on, the more it became apparent I had bitten off more than I could chew. No matter how hard I tried, I could not get a lift, and I was forced to walk in the snow all day. By the time it got dark, the cold had cut through my bones. I knew I had to find shelter, or there was a good chance I would freeze to death in the sub-zero temperatures on the motorway. I kept driving myself on until about 8pm in the dark. I came across a petrol station on the side of the motorway that had a cafe and public toilets. It was so good to sit in the cafe, thaw my bones and sip a hot coffee. All the same, it was becoming apparent I was underprepared for the journey home and I needed to get out of there and across the border at Arkin as soon as possible. Soon... So after a cold night sitting in the freezing public toilets and the relatively warm cafe, I was still awake at dawn, standing on the motorway outside the petrol station trying to thumb a lift. The morning passed by, then the afternoon. All the trucks seemed to be heading south to Cologne, and there weren't too many cars. I got more and more cold and tired, unable to get round to the border, and I knew that I was in trouble deep. One day turned into two, then three. The cafe closed about 2am, so I was forced to shelter in the freezing public toilets. I couldn't sleep, and the lack of food and cold started to take a huge toll on me. On the second day of my entrapment in this place, some guy ordered some Venus schnitzel, took one bite, looked straight at me, and left. If it wasn't for that meal he left behind, I probably wouldn't have survived that huge journey home. After, th- after three days stuck at the gas station, I knew I had to strike out or die. I walked some 30 kilometres down and round to the Arkin border. The weather warmed up enough to rain and I got saturated. Then the temperature dropped so low, my clothes froze solid on my body and I thought I would freeze to death. But I drove myself on and met up with a bloke in a car at the border. He was a real nice bloke who worked for BASF in Brussels and gave me a lift from the German border to the centre of Brussels in Belgium. I slept all the way and managed to recharge the batteries and regain my dissolve to get back to London no matter what. I knew that Ostend was the closest port to Brussels but I had no map, food or money and no idea which direction to go. I was still exhausted and I stumbled into the underground. I guessed which way to go, despite the fact I knew nothing of Belgium, or could speak no Belgian. I got to the outskirts and followed what looked like a main road till sunset. It was snowing and very cold, and I was getting desperate to find respite from the freezing road. I came across an old Gothic church and pounded on its massive doors, but neither God nor his representative answered my calls, so I stumbled off down the motorway out of Brussels. I came across a sign pointing to Gaunt and guessed that it must be halfway to Ostend. It was too late to turn back, so I had to risk everything and walk all night, hitchhiking in the dark and the snow. The side of the motorway was slippery with ankle-deep snow. Slowly the wind and snow exhausted me as I marched on through the night. I had only eaten one meal in three days and had had a few hours sleep in four days. By 10pm I was utterly exhausted. I had walked about 20 kilometres and could take no more. I found a bridge and crawled underneath to get out of the foul weather. I felt so tired all I could think of was curling up and going to sleep. Eerily as I started to lose consciousness I could hear my father's voice urging me to keep going, not to fall asleep there or I would surely die. I headed back to the motorway and I was so tired I was stumbling all over the place. The traffic was light but finally his car skidded to a stop some 200 metres in front of me. I stumbled as fast as I could 
and the lady driver drove me some 20 kilometres down the motorway. Her car was so comfortable and warm. Why did you stop and pick me up, I asked her. Because you looked like you needed help, was all she said to me. It was just enough to keep me going. Around 11pm a bunch of guys picked me up. The car was full and they were pissed but full of fun. I had to lie down over their legs in the back seat with my pack over my back, uncomfortable but another 15 kilometres closer to gone. After that, I was utterly spent. Back out in the wind and the snow, I stumbled along, slipping in and out of consciousness. Around about midnight, one o'clock in the morning, a bloke picked me up. He introduced himself as Peter and told me he was going through to Gone. He said I could stay with some friends of his who sold Persian carpets. I was too weak to argue, though I had the most horrible feeling I was about to meet a horrible end. We arrived at about one in the morning at a place called Room with a View, and I entered the dark shop and ascended the flight of stairs. At the top of the stairs I entered a huge dining room. There was an extremely long table there, covered in white linen and lit with a series of candles. About eight people were sitting around it, and I was introduced to Marty and his wife, who owned the place. They invited me to sit down and gave me some steak, a joint, and a half a packet of menthol cigarettes. Despite my rising fear, I indulged in the sustenance offered in this most bizarre of midnight feasts. We ate, chatted and smoked into the small hours, then Marty showed me my room, which featured a cast iron bath. I drew a bath and had my first soak in nearly a week, then passed out in crisp linen sheets. I slept for the next two days and nights and slowly regained my strength. After that, I spent a couple of days wandering around the beautiful medieval town that had managed to survive the Blitzkrieg of the Nazis. Then it was time for me to push on to the coast. I only had £20 left, enough to pay for the ferry across the channel. I couldn't afford to pay Marty for the accommodation, but he was fine with that and dropped me off on the outskirts of town and wished me good luck. I hugged him and thanked him sincerely for being there when I needed him so badly. Those sort of things you never forget. Within 15 minutes of being dropped off, I was picked up by John, who lived just five minutes out from Ostend. I spent a few days with these people, and as it turns out, his wife was dying of cancer. I stayed with her for a few days, but I had to explain I not, could not give her all the answers she needed. Leaving John and Susan to face the next few feet, weeks is one of the hardest things I ever had to do. They dropped me off at the port and I was lucky enough to meet up with a truck driver who gave me a free lift all the way from Dover to London. I only had to walk 10 kilometres home to my squat and I marched back hardly able to believe the adventure that had just unfolded. Once again I was able to cheat death, yet I lost so much along the way. Over the next few weeks I settled back into my life in London, reflecting upon all the trials I had to face and all the wonderful people who came together to save my life. The longest march home is a winter I will never forget. The end. Time is up for another day. Thank you all very much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed and I hope you share this with your friends. Remember, it's on uh, podcast on Arrow's uh, radio. Thanks very much to Michael, Veronica, Wirapper TV and all the sponsors. And thank you all very much for tuning in and supporting me. I really appreciate that. I hope you have a good week and I hope to be back next week. Bye for now.